Beautiful anyway. Okay, here we, here we go. One, two, three. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to myself, Max McGillivray from Beanstalk.Global. If you aren't aware of um, uh, Beanstalk.Global, we are the social enterprise that supports, educates, and promotes the global fresh food industry to help it thrive and grow faster. I forgot to mention it. We've got a, a lovely uh, deck that if you wanted to see sight of that, more than happy to ping that over, over to you so that uh, you can see more detail as to the social enterprise that Beanstalk is and what we're looking to do, what we're looking to achieve. We were hoping to launch in the summer of this year, but because of everything that has, uh, has happened, uh, we managed to accelerate uh, the, the, the launch to create these webinars uh, in the first place to hopefully educate, communicate, and throw a little bit of humor into these quite interesting times. And on that basis, we're running two webinars a week on a Tuesday and a Friday. And we're very lucky to garner some amazing guests to, um, uh, to, to come and join us. So on, on that basis, we've got some uh, great people today, and we've just got to get them to say hello and where, where they're from. So Julie, you start us off. Where are you? Hi, I'm Julie Klein. I'm here in Zone 2 London, actually in my shed studio cooking um, studio that I've set up in the last week or so, um, having lots of fun here. I'm founder of a company called Sustainable Kitchen. We're a team of chefs who are all nutrition-based um, sorry, nutrition trained, and we're specialists in plant based and allergen free cooking. And over to the other guy. Fantastic. Clive, where are you, please? Uh, good afternoon. I'm Clive Williamson. We are Maynard House in Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk. We're fruit farmers, been farming apples for three generations, and we make apple juice here on the farm. What's your favourite apple juice that you make, Clive? Definitely Topson Brown, mate. I uh, know, and I love your. I, no, I disagree. I love your your raspberry one. Your raspberry one is even better. Oh, well, we grow the raspberries and add them to the apples. So yeah, it's also as good as Cox and Brownie. Oh, you, you're just showing off now. Growing your own raspberries. Right over to Chris. Chris, where are you today, please? Uh, hello, I'm Chris Bavin. I am uh, in Surrey, just at home, as most of us are. Uh, I'm currently a TV presenter, uh, but have formerly worked in the fresh produce industry for over twenty years. Fantastic. And last but not least, we have the votes in from Norfolk. The vote is in from Dan in Norfolk. What are the votes, please, Dan? There's three of us from Norfolk in total. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, Dan Hewitt, uh, work for Kettle Foods based in Norwich in Norfolk. Um, been doing uh, Norfolk Ag for about 25 years now, half of my life. Good to see you all. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. Um, we could not get to this stage with that beanstalk if it wasn't for our amazing sponsors who are behind us um so if you want to have a look at them in a bit more detail or if you're not not aware of them if you're a student or a consumer uh, please get in contact with me so i can give you a bit more inf information but they're, they're a great spread of businesses in the uk and overseas all with the common theme of growing amazing fresh produce for us all to uh, to enjoy and it goes without saying that we couldn't uh, be doing this if it wasn't for you dialing in either now live or on the records um, to date I think we've done four or five webinars and we've had significant number of uh, views and we, we seem to be stretching out all over the place from Te uh, Todd in California sorry Todd um, to Randy out in uh, Thailand Clayton down in South Africa um, and even a uh, mate of mine Dishy Dave in, uh, in Bognor Regis um, Julie have you heard the have you, you Julie you haven't got any relations in uh, Bognor Regis have you? Uh, not that I know of Oh, here comes my bad joke on the basis that Dan gave us a bad joke about uh, um, uh, about Norfolk earlier. Um, Julie, did you hear about the earthquake that happened in uh, Bognor Regis three years ago? It did it did four, four million pounds worth of improvements. It's all in the timing, isn't it? So, so guys, so guys, just let me um, uh, give you a bit of a state of the nation from us, and also some uh, messages that we've been asked to uh, to to read out. It, it's it's a fascinating the, the period that we're in. Uh, currently, and uh, it's interesting how that the the market, in some respects, is coming to us to the fresh food, fresh fresh sector. Um, in the FPJ Fresh Produce Journal earlier this week, there's a big article about how fruit and veg should be focused of the COVID-19 fight, that there are leading academics who are calling for the government to place less emphasis on big retailers and more on fruit and veg availability. So when we get out the other side of this, there's a prediction that um, more and more people will be wanting to eat more and more fresh produce, which comes on to um, our subject of, um, of today. Um, and Dan and I have got a, um, a great contact, Peter Worsley at, at RAP, 
who was quite keen to mention that uh, Rap have set up a generic email address, which I'll stick on the um, on the follow up uh, uh, email a little bit later, which is surplus at rap.org.uk for any businesses who find themselves with surplus stock that are struggling to redistribute to charity or donate to those in uh, those in need. Um, so so we'll, we'll look to push that out, and Dan might look to mention his uh, involvement with uh, with Rap a little a little bit later. Um, and, and this. Uh, the, 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 as we as we said and as we know everything seems to be very fluid um clive and i were talking this morning about farm shops how farm shops are getting hellishly busy uh with the consumers looking to go in that direction and perhaps um the into a retailer um we got a a, a person who very kindly contacted us to say that farm shops who are delivering thousands of fruit and veg boxes are really struggling both with the supply and also with the rapid price increase I suppose it's it's no real shock to know, but it's actually quite alarming to see how how quickly the prices are escalating. Cauliflowers, as an example, was seven pound a box a week ago. Uh, Twenty three pound was quoted yesterday, and fruit has been cleared, um, which has best value. So a pineapple can pop up in a box with Kent spuds. Um, and the other even more alarming bit that we've um, picked up is that, and I suppose we've all got to be wary of this, that there's uh, um, companies who are supplying uh some other businesses and those companies who are supplying aren't getting paid but they know that the product has been sold by that that third party um and why is that is is there a concern especially in the food service sector that there might be some companies who are looking to um get as much cash in from the consumer um and get uh, as much product in from from their suppliers and not pay them to see them through this uh, this period and maybe worst case Worst, worst case, look to wind themselves up, store that cash and uh, wind through this situation, mothball themselves and come up as a, as a phoenix. But there seems to be more and more cases of people being unpaid for the supply that they're making. And we're also picking up that there were even fights in New Spitterfields and New Covent Garden market earlier this week with really sad report that one trader has had to purchase stab vests for his team. So there's a desperation now for fresh produce as, uh, as potentially the, the supply goes um, goes short. But trying, trying to find a positive out of this, it's interesting how a, a number of more intelligent people than I have already looking to predict as to what's going to happen when we do eventually get out of this situation and that there's definitely going to be a, a societal change. Um, there, there was talk this morning about the likes of HS2 being scrapped um, and putting that money into um, high high speed internet so the likes of Dan and Norfolk can, can actually communicate with us um, um, properly because lots of people have suddenly found that through this sort of technology actually it's no problem whatsoever to, to work from home. I, I think I, I said on um, one of the earlier uh, podcasts that um, the likes of uh, what's the likes of WordPress, American business, and our recruitment uh, business that uh, we use the word word surf, word press um, software um, that they employ 5,000 people globally and they don't have one office they've never had an office so why do we all have to have these uh, big expensive um, offices and, and people uh, spending too much time in a car and um, polluting the environment when actually we could all be um, sat at sat at home so there's as, as per the conversation that we had with the guys on on Tuesday at last webinar it does feel like there's going to be a big reset that's going to going to happen hopefully to the advantage of all of us and especially to the uh, fresh food fresh produce sector so so this comes on to the, our subject of today which is why now is the time to support British growers and fresh food um, we, I did have a debate with some other people online this morning that we're, we're not li looking to be xenophobic towards um, um, overseas growers. And Clayton, if you're if you're watching um, from Cape Town, so he's my buddy. He runs um, one of the the, the, the uh, really good grape associations in South Africa. I went out of my way this morning when I was doing the the zombie shop, shopping run, and um, I got some great gra grapes from South Africa, from the Hex River Valley, hopefully from one, one of Clayton's um, members. So the, the purpose of this webinar is, is not to lambast overseas growers, because we obviously want to support them. But now, isn't there a time now where we need to support the British grower, especially in the, in the labour requirements that we'll talk about, um, and also to, to get them to the front of people's perception that they actually do do a lot of good to raise their public awareness so people do doff their cap at the likes of Clive and other growers and, and farmers and look, look to buy their, buy their produce. But let, let's start with um, with Julie, because if, 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 you, if you everyone's seen, I'll just swap it over to uh, gallery view, that um, Julie's actually um, in, in her kitchen. And Julie, it looks like you're going to do something. Are you, are you going to, are you going to be, are you going to be concocting something for us a little bit later? I'm going to cook something. So I'm um, going to just do a very quick demo 
um, of how to, to cook something very simple at home. We heard that there was some shortage of people get, uh, being able to get simple things like eggs, for example. So I'm going to do an egg alternative savoury dish. So um, hang around and I'll do it later. Fantastic. And Julia, what's your view of this, the, this, the situation we're in from your perspective as, as a chef and a, as, a, as a professional nutritionist? What's your view? Yeah, well, so, I mean, just even in, in my local community here um, in, in London, you know, so, so we're only one stop from, from London Bridge, so quite central. Um, we've got a community cafe here um, that was built by the community about 10 years ago. Obviously, it had to close um, because of social distancing rules, etc. But that's now been turned into, in the last uh, two weeks, a, um, a, a hub for a local veg box scheme. And the local cafe have been sourcing veg from wholesale, wholesale prices and they're distributing around the, the community. Um, yes, people are going to our local Sainsbury's, which is not too far away, but some people are scared about it, about doing that. You made reference there to the zombie shop. Um, and people are, you know, unwell and, and self-isolating and can't get out. So the community is kind of rallied together to come together and, and deliver these boxes um to, to people who aren't able to get out and you know there's talk of you know should we really should be continuing this post um self-isolation it makes total sense yeah. uh, julia you stole my words what what's your prediction six months a year down the line do you think joe schmo consumer will be still buying from that uh, new innovative box scheme or will they have gone back to waitrose sainsbury's tesco at all I, I think it comes down to a couple of things max you know, I mean, there's a real challenge where people don't seem to know how to cook anymore. So, um, and, and they are so used to being able to go to the supermarket where they can get, uh, you know, produce from, from anywhere in the world at any time. So we don't eat seasonally anymore. Um, and, you know, we, we know that. And, we're, you know, these veg box um, schemes that are coming from the wholesalers, it's all coming from local produce at the, at the moment. Um, and so, you know, as long as people learn how to, you know, celebrate um, local seasonal food and learn how to cook with it, then yeah, hopefully they will stick with that. Well done, Clive. What's your view? What's happening on your street for, for the one of red expression? Um, well, our biggest challenge at the moment is going to be harvesting this crop. Um, you know, we've got a lot of strawberries, a lot of raspberries, and then a lot of apples to pick. We've had hundreds and literally hundreds and hundreds of people apply for jobs expecting for us to pick strawberries tomorrow. Um, again, they don't understand when the um, when the product is, is going to be on the shelves from the UK, because strawberries and raspberries seem to be all year round. And, you know, they think that strawberries are growing today. We're only just planting the, planting the plants at the moment. They'll be ready in 12 weeks time. So again, it comes down to the, the naivety of um, the, the British population that we all know, the, the, the throwaway stat that I use day in, day out, that six out of uh, 10 kids don't know where fruit and veg comes from. And that, that uh, uh, is accentuated, so get my words out, accentuated with, the, with their parents and also their the, the teachers. Perhaps there'll be a positive ad out of this, Clive, that people will understand more about the growing cycle and how the likes of you you and your, your, your family operate. Yeah, I think you know, we will have some shortage in certain things, but I think the supermarkets will bring everything back onto the shelves once all this has calmed down. Um, I, I'm fearful of people setting up a lot of little independent um, fruit and veg shops, thinking that they're going to have something going forward. Um, consumers' pockets are not deep, and they're going to be even less deep by the time we finish um, this whole event. And therefore, the supermarkets, unfortunately, will be the cheaper option. And, and this goes back to uh, the conversation that we have having on the webinar on, on Tuesday, that there needs to be price inflation. But as uh, Kate Cooper from uh, Brum stated, there's actually going to be even more, potentially more food poverty because there's going to be less money in the in the pocket. Clive, I think I, I sent you through a, a link from, it was a bit of a bizarre example, but from a squire, just um, magazine, just pointing out where, um, what the timeline of this is going to be in that the, the general population has gone out and panic bought. They've got all this food. There's been huge waste levels now the issue is going to be that they're going to run out of money in two to three months time because they've um, maxed out their credit cards or and they haven't got a got a job so they're not going to be able to pay for potentially fresh food especially if there's a, an escalation in, uh, in price um, quick Chris, Chris just move, moving over to you that so you've got a really unique background can you just run through your your background and then give your take on, on the on the situations you see it please 
Yeah, okay. So I started uh, as a fresh flower importer when I was about 16, 17, supplying the wholesale markets. Did that for a few years. Then I had a sort of sideways move into, into fresh produce. So predominantly importing and supplying the wholesale markets. I have supplied the, the retail multiples and discounters and, uh, you know, industry and caterers. Um, I did that for probably the best part of 20 odd years. And I had a shop for eight or nine years. I had a veg box business. We were one of the first retailers to do no single use plastic packaging, which was called the Naked Grocer. So it was a bit too, probably too ahead of its time, really. That was in 2009. Uh, and then sort of various different jobs in and around the industry uh, since then. Okay, and and your 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 take, Chris, because we were just having a quick conversation where we were testing the line line earlier um, on on this whole labour bit and the food awareness. If, if you're going to be you're going to be more knowledgeable than any of us in some respects because you've been at the shop end of, of, a, of a camera when when you've been travelling around doing your TV work. What what's the what's the feeling that you've had pre this this crisis? Did, were people understanding of British uh, produce? Were they interested in the British produce, or, or did they just see it as a monosyllabic thing, whether it be a, a strawberry wherever it came from or a can of red bull wherever that came from again what's your thoughts well it's some and some i think in in some instances provenance has become quite important to people i think we need to be careful that we don't take too much uh notice of our echo chamber so you know we could all sit here well said being being part of the industry saying everybody cares about you know they don't just want to know where it's grown they want to know the farmer's name they want to you know the backstory all of that because it's lovely and it sort of it suits our narrative, but but you don't have to go too far afield to find that that isn't the case everywhere. We've done, the, the multiples have done a good job in commoditizing produce. Commoditizing it is good in the sense that it feels accessible and an everyday purchase, but that also, it has a negative connotation that actually we don't really differentiate. But So your punnet of grapes, for example, there, we've now dumbed down grapes to, to red and white. Yep. Red, white and black. You know, no varieties, no, you know, I mean, the variety is on there. But basically, you know, we, we've condensed so many different um, items of fresh produce into literally just the umbrella terminology. You know, it is apple. It is easy peeler. It is grape. It is red. It is white. It is this. You know, we're not. So actually, we're taking information away from the guy. So it's really hard then to to expect a consumer to have that sort of information but i just quite i'd like to, to my general take on on things as as it stands is and this is sort of twofold really not only the, the he, he, he's off everyone he's off he's sorry, off everyone yeah, he's play. no no you you go you go for it chris sorry, you go for sorry, it sorry sorry I'll, I'll keep it as brief as i can uh, do not say sorry this is what we need this is what everyone wants to hear you go 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 so it's twofold so the, the if we look at the british produce and we look at the, the, the change in, in the where we're buying our produce from. So, the, you know, the farm shops or the veg box delivery schemes or the, the, the little independent greengrocers. Both of those things. Now, the, the importance of those things has just become wildly apparent to, to, to everybody. I dread to think what sort of situation we would be in, in, in terms of, of food supply and people being able to fill their fridges and cupboards up with food if it wasn't for people supplying the direct veg boxes, the green grocers, they have absolutely saved the day to my mind. You know, we saw we saw people not being able to get into supermarkets. We saw empty supermarket shelves and I'm not lambasting the supermarkets. I think they've done an amazing job and I think they've handled a very, very difficult situation very well. But we we need a strong independent retail sector for when things like this happen. But unfortunately, you can't just use them when things like this happen. You need to make sure that we're supporting them all year round. So when there is a disaster, we have a plan B. Because if we don't support our English growers, our UK growers, and our UK high street and small independent retailers, the day when the supermarket shelves run bare, there will be no alternative. And that is not a particularly a place that any of us wish to find ourselves. And I would like to congratulate so, so many people in the fresh produce industry for stepping up to the plate and just going above and beyond. I know green grocers that are, that, you know, two, three men bands, or, you know, not men, you know, two, two or three people, little, little small family business. They are literally working around the clock, going from supplying 20, 30, 50 veg boxes to two, 3,000 in the space of a week. 
These guys have done an incredible job. They should be applauded. They should be recognised. They should be celebrated. And they should be supported when all the dust settles. Because from what I'm understanding, and I will stop in a second, from what I'm understanding now, the supermarkets are starting to, re to, to reduce some of their restrictions on purchase. So, you know, where they were sort of limiting some items that you could only buy one or two or three or whatever, that's starting to ease off, which gives me the sense that it's starting to calm down and, and they're starting to you get to get to grips with the new world order so but we need to carry on you know and, and going you know back to, to clive's point you know hopefully by the end of this they will still have custom because you know they deserve it as far as i'm concerned sorry <laughs> uh, no well, well said i think it, it definitely needs to be said again i go back to this expression we used on uh, tuesday there needs to be a reset and it's fascinating this this type of conversation because it seems to assimilate where we should be going for the fresh produce sector it, it, chris what you say about having an independent retail sector to the consumer is is, is fascinating and it's right on message the, the the only concern i have is just putting my commercial head on 85 percent of all fruit and veg as of two months ago, was sold through the, the, the retail sector. And as we know, as you emphasize, that the problem there is that the, the, the retailers don't allow brands. They, they want people to come in and to buy that product at uh, least cost so that they then do want to run the rest of the store and buy the other branded product at higher margin that they make better margin on. So then it does need to be that, that reset. But then there's that oxymoron, as, as Kate Cooper from Brum was saying, that if we raise the, the price of um, fruit and veg, um, those who need it, who who need it for the, this type of um, ep epidemic to, to be healthy, can't can't afford the damn stuff. Um, yeah. Dan, over to, over to you. What's your take, please? And, and Dan, can you just give a bit of background on you and your, your amazing business? And also, how many potatoes a year go through your facility? Because there, there, there'll be kids watching this that will love to know that. Great question. Let me get a calculator out. Um, <laughs> Hi, uh, Dan, uh, Head of Agriculture for Kettle Foods, who make the Kettle Chips brand uh, here in Norfolkshire, um, based in Norwich. Um, proud company, over 30 years doing this, um, and have a, a remarkable story to tell, um, not just today, but um, for the last few years about how we supply the factory. Um, I can say today that we are still producing 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Why? Uh, a remarkable team back at Kettle, um, but an equally remarkable team out on farm who today, seven days a week, managed to supply the factory, absolutely not dropped a stitch and so proud of them for doing so in such difficult circumstances. And not only are they supplying, but they're planting for next year's crop as well whilst they're doing that. So, uh, and they do it year in, year out, all, all from, from Norfolk. Um, so that, that's, a, that's the, the, the kettle piece. Um, we buy locally. Uh, I think our average uh, food miles, road miles for potatoes is less than 36 miles now, which is uh, for an international brand that travels over 27 countries. Uh, I think it's something that the, the, the area and the, the, the country should be rightly proud of, success stories. Um, today, I look... Um, and there's, there's some horror stories out there without a shadow of a doubt. Um, some really great friends that have set up some really, really innovative businesses over the last few years um, are going to struggle to come out of this. You know, the, the serious, seriousness of the situation and how it's developed so quickly is staggering. Uh, the word unprecedented has been used unprecedentedly over the last two or three weeks. Um, my, my take on the local shops is bravo. Um, they've stepped up. It's it's almost like going back pre our supermarket era um, to corner shops and local food stores. Um, the trick is, as everyone has, has rightly said, how do we continue that at the end of this? We still need our major yeah. retailers. They are a massive support lifeline in the way that we live in modern times. Dan, Dan, Dan isn't the easiest answer that those retailers just need to pay us more. Need to, need to pay you more yeah it's 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 a reflection isn't it um everyone wants volume um and i think today do people today value a cauliflower more was it we were talking earlier about the the cost of a box of cauliflower and the fact that it's tripled in the last 10 days and what's the real price of a cauliflower essentially what's the real price of a sack of potatoes a sack of potatoes today no one wanted them a week ago Today, um, everyone wants a sack of potatoes. It's a great staple uh, for a family. So 
you, you, you're right. I think we all need, everyone needs more money. Um, it's whether the consumer is w willing to pay that extra. But, but have I answered my question in some respects? That if the consumer cannot tolerate food inflation, but there needs to be food inflation, could the retailers not give you and Clive and all the other growers more margin? There's, there's always room for more margin, isn't there? I, I think for me, it's trying to simplify, simplify the way that we do business. Um, so the, the way that I do business on behalf of Kettle Foods is very straightforward. I have a direct contract with our growers so I can maintain all margin straight to the grower. There, there is no, no one between myself and our growers. Um, and I think our growers benefit greatly from that. Yeah, now you've got a unique business. And Dan, you have to answer this question because I'm getting, I've had three texts in. How many potatoes do you buy a year? Come on, I need to know. The, the, uh, no, fifth text in. Okay, so, so 60, around about 60,000 tonnes. Wow. Uh, hang on, I can work. I think my calculator will work that out. Because <laughs> um, I've got enough noughts. So that's about 2,200 truckloads that come into the Norwich site each year. And so any someone that's far brainier than I, 2,200 truckloads, about 170,000 potatoes on each truckload. My calculator's just gone E. Uh, Dan, thank you. Fantastic. Right. Kids kid who are texting me, stop. You've got the answer now from Dan the man. Um, J Jason, Jason Burgess, he's, uh, he's he's great at throwing in quest questions to us. Uh, oh, he's, he's going to jump to another one. Um, his question was, oh, actually, don't apologize, J Jason, I'll come back to you. Uh, Paul, are we being failed by initiatives such as Red Tractor? And if so, what can we do to educate consumers of the British food and produce? Clive, come on, you're in the, um, in the, in the trenches on this one. What's your view? Is our Clive there? He's was on mute. The mic's Sorry. not on. Mute. That's better. Um, I was just saying, I don't think that the red tractor is promoted enough by the supermarkets. It, it appears on the back of a lot of packets. And, um, you know, I go in sometimes and buy pork and bacon or something like that. One time I'm buying British bacon. The next time I go in, it's exactly the same packaging um, and it's lost the British flag. And I look closely on the back and it's from um, Danish bacon. And I, you know, without careful study i don't know where i'm buying it from okay so what what's your view with the various initiatives like red tractor and and leaf so do you think going for this word, word of the of the week again that reset that there needs to be more promotion of those schemes and those schemes of of you and the other uk growers yes there definitely needs to be more promotion and that will only happen and at the coalface uh, with the supermarkets it can't happen back here on the farm we just don't have enough coverage. We don't have enough um, visibility to the consumer. Okay, and uh, Julie, just coming to you with your chef and your nutritionist hat on. Do you, do you think the likes of these schemes that we've talked about? Do you, do you think they are advantageous to you in your professional career, and also for the the people that you're looking to educate? Yeah, I think so. So, I mean, the, the main reason I set up Sustainable Kitchen. So, you know, we've been working in the health and wellness sector for a while. Um, you know, catering for yoga retreats, etc. But there's a huge um, fuel gap, even in, you know, mainstream uh, chefs, you know, and and the colleges even now that um, are training up future chefs. They're not trained in fat-based cooking. They're not trained in the allergen cooking, etc. So, and or even actually even being very agile and 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 seasonal. I'm probably um, giving a bit of discredit to some some colleges, so apologies if I'm being a bit broad brushed there. But generally, you know, legacy chefs haven't been trained in this kind of thing. So, so I think this is, uh, you know, this is one of the main reasons I set up the company to to address that gap and help um, businesses, you know, uh, cater for people who are looking for more um, health oriented dishes. Um, and sustainable and, and that consider you know, planetary health as well as personal health. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and Julie, with the presumably your, your offer of what you can do could be very broad, and that you can do the yoga retreats, but presumably you can assist schools who, who want to get yeah. the, this education when we have this reset. Yeah, yeah. No, so, so, some of the chefs in my team do work with um, chefs in schools, um, helping them. We work with cookery schools as well, um, training up. You know, uh, general public as, as well as young teens so yeah we do do a, a broad range of things like that well done and uh, one of our contributors uh, um, has just said 
uh, sent a message in to say that there's a new red tractor logo being launched this year as part of their 20 year anniversary. This will lead to supermarket packaging redesigns, perhaps a time to highlight it clearer. So we'll, we'll see what happens on, on there. Um, some retailers are trying to push price of British produce down. Uh, when do you think they will start to support the British farmer with a reasonable price? Um, Chris, I'm just going to throw that at, at you with your sort of broad brush um, uh, background. What, what's your thoughts? Is, is, should there be a price premium for British produce over imported? Well, the cost is of, of British produce is, is interesting, isn't it? Because obviously the economies of scale from some of the larger farms, you know, naturally heated, naturally light farms, um can can produce cheaper but then obviously you've got the transport you know additional transport so you know in terms of cost i don't know where they sort of meet should they have a premium i suppose not i don't think we should be as uh, you've got to be careful how you work. yeah <laughs> i think it's it's okay to just say just because it was grown here it deserves a premium I don't know if that's fair. I think it should be each case on its own merit. And I think, you know, listen, I think we have some of the best growers in the world here, but I don't think it can be. And because what will happen, you have to be careful because if you reward everybody just because of, a low ca you know, yeah. ge geography or location, this is, we've seen this sort of thing before, you know, where there's, you know, great cooperatives. And what you do is you punish the really good growers and you reward the really bad growers because as long as they put the Union Jack sticker on the packet, they get a premium so i think you need to be careful in terms of that i i personally would would put it at a, at a, at a premium i think you know just purely because of, of the, the you know the quality of it but there's also some incredible quality coming from from various parts of, of the world you know i think what we need to make sure is cost of production is being met at, re, uh, at you know in terms of uh, point of sale that's you know yeah, well, well, that's, that's been an issue over the years where actually, you know, some some price, some of the prices we pay for produce doesn't necessarily represent the price, the price of production. And then and this is where the whole thing then becomes a mess because consumers, you ha how can you ask a consumer to value a product when they're not actually being asked to pay for it? Spot on. Well done. And, and Clive, Dan, you've both got very strong brands for, for your products, which is pr pretty unusual and in, in fresh produce per, per se. Clive, why did you create a brand for your for your product? You said, why did I create a brand? Correct. Why did you create a brand for Maynard House? Um, we, are, you know, I always think we're a premium product. You know, we're in, in the apple juice world. You go from Tetra Pak all the way through to um, pure pressed apple juice. Um, we needed a brand that was going to fit the market we were selling to, which is very much the premium end. We sell to premium end hotels in the city. And, you know, the people here locally recognize a brand, which is a local brand. So we need a, we need a strong local premium brand to, to promote that. Excellent. Well done. And uh, we just had a really interesting point in from Jackie, Jackie Green. Three, four weeks ago, we, we were the, but the butt end of um, the industry sector. The, we were having all these issues about uh, immigration. There was government advisors saying that um, uh, UK agriculture and fisheries uh, were, were null and void. We should adopt a Singaporean system and, um, and just be done with us. And now we've, um, as, as Chris has so passionately indicated, we've really come to the rescue of the retail sector in the respect of the, of the fresh food. And, and um, all of you guys have, have reinvented yourself. But how do we align governments from Jackie? We fall between DEFRA, um, uh, immigration issues on, on labour. Who has our back for British? Dan, who has our back for being British, for, for the likes of yourself being, being British growers? I, I, I genuinely think that government actually does want um, a vibrant uh, sector. I, I genuinely do believe that. I think it's um, incumbent upon the sector, though, to, to start to think... Um, this has been a bloody nose for lots of people, and I and I genuinely hope that it's now starts to stimulate more debate um, in a in a bizcom way. If this happens again, how do we do? How do we deal with it? Um, I, I I I I've never ever met anyone that doesn't want to buy British. If I'm honest with you, um, people love the the locality. They love um, provenance is is king for us as a brand. So um, absolutely globally. Yeah, you're right. You know, bananas from Malaysia, all of those things all happen. Um, we could talk about seasonality, you know, UK produce and seasonality. For me, this is a marketing issue. 
Um, we yeah. need to well tell said. a much, much better story about what we do as an industry. Uh, we need, uh, at, at the end of this, there is a real opportunity for us to realign with the general public and go, we stepped up, we continue to step up. So the likes of the NFU play a, 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 a vital role. Minette Batters is a fantastic spokesperson for, for, Brit, for British agriculture. Um, but there is an opportunity we, na- we, we mustn't forget when this is done, and it will be done at some stage, it will be done. We need to get back around the table and look at what was important. Yeah, and Max, can I just say, so in a, in a previous life, I worked in financial services for my firm and, and was around with the 2008 financial crash. And I agree with, with um, you know, the question that was just asked that you said from Jackie Green and also what Chris has been talking about. We do need an independent body that's regulating without stifling the industry, but you know, putting in place some, you know, some, some regulations around capping certain price increases so that we don't see these spikes and, and you know, coming up with rules and regulations that, that, that do um, allow a, a level playing field. I don't know how you do that. Is it Could- the because you, you make a really good point but when we were just testing the lines earlier chris and i were um were debating this issue that there's eighty thousand people that are required to uh to, to use the g's expression feed the nation um and that podcast uh, webinar a week ago I, I was indicating that we'd heard that there's the potential that the borders uk borders would be closed this weekend uh, it hasn't hasn't happened but in effect it's still the same because of the travel restrictions that the people who are in the uk now are going to be those that um uh, pick their crop and here, here lies the problem that if we need um eighty thousand people there's lots of different messages coming out from lots of different companies and lots of different organization uh, trying to extol the virtues of people to come and work on the land but the time is not right and there seems to be half a dozen uh, websites have suddenly sprung up to, um, to to try and find this this labour either on on the on the correct basis or they're trying to capitalise um, on it. Um, if there was an overarching body mechanism that could could take control of, of that alone, it, it just shows. Dan, it comes back to you. It just shows the NFU is doing a great job, but they're just in in agriculture. There doesn't seem to be a body covering the whole of fresh foods per se. And if there was, they, they'd be able to put the message out uh, about about the job requirement and um, look to manage that that flow because the, the, some of the workers aren't required now, they're required um, a month, two months um, da- down the line. So are we, are we all coming to the conclusion that, again, again, in this reset, that if there's something like the, the NFU that could be broadened out and be the mothership and to be the voice of the, of the fresh food sectors, would, would that be a better place to, to put us in, Chris? Yeah, 100%. Um, I think, you know, if you, if you think about where we are as a, as, a, as, a, you know, as a population, we're obsessed with food. You know, I mean, if you if you look on your your phones and your social media accounts, you know, we are a nation absolutely obsessed with food, talking about it, cooking it, blah, blah, blah. But yet we've probably never been as disconnected from it. And how is that? How is it? And how is an industry the size of ours, you know, absolutely enormous? You know, I, I hear sort of anecdotal comparisons you know bigger than the automotive and the, the the airline industry put together absolutely enormous and yet we've got no spokesperson no voice no no external communication which is, is i find baffling we should be you know we should be absolutely banging the drum for not only british produce but the actual industry what it's doing people working around the clock what we're supplying like all the charity work that goes on, all the innovative, all the new developments and stuff, but no one hears about it. You know, we, we talk to each other about it, which is like preaching to the converted and absolutely pointless. We need to be talking to the yeah. people. And this is what it's about. And, you know, and, and if there was campaigns actually saying that, you know, whatever it might be, a, a price of milk or a cauliflower or a cabbage costs the grower this, therefore it should never cost less than that. Or, you know, this is the season for this and this is what you should be doing with it. You know, there is an appetite for it, but we're not doing it. We're not saying, we're not technically, it's like, it's like we're, we're, we're more secretive than the Masons, the fresh produce industry. You know, no one, no one should ever know what's going on outside of our walls. But it's quite, we need to, we need to tell people, we need to include people and we need to you know, spread the word of, of what an amazing industry is. Because who's going to come and work in an industry that they've got no oh. idea what goes on? Absolutely. You know, you know we, we need to we need to celebrate it to such an extent that it actually becomes an aspirational career, an aspirational job. 
you know, an aspirational product, you know, all of these things, this is what we need to do, but we need a, we need a marketing budget. We need a campaign. We need, you know, we need a, a, a singular mechanism to, to talk about um, the, the labor shortages. We need a single mechanism to talk about, you know, costs, why the things go up. Like if you, if you tell the average person on the street that the cost of produce goes up and down, they look at you like you're mad. <laughs> yeah. Why? Well why? said. Well, so I, I, you you speak, Chris. You're speaking to, for for so many people. There's a number of people making comment that they 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 now want you to be the the fresh produce, the fresh food leader, and it, <laughs> and and, and, you, and you look at all, all the various organisations. I I, I, won't, I don't want to name them or embarrass them, but it is they 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 all rightly so I suppose in some respects looking out for their own particular sector. But they, but if they all came together as one, and as you as you've indicated, have a a a, a sector a spokesman for themselves to drive this all forward, this reset that's going to happen is going to be so beneficial to the to the sector. We just got to get through it, have the reset, create this. Go on, Chris. Go on. Sorry, sorry, to, 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 I'm a bad form, but I will just very quickly interject. Can anybody tell me, anybody, has, has anybody been on the news? Has anybody from the fresh produce industry been on the news? I don't, don't, don't even get me down there. It's, for the for last year, yeah, every time... Oh, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me have a every, every time that there's um, a big debate about food nutrition, they, they wheel out someone from the Food and Drink Council. They, there's never any representative from the, from the fresh produce sector. So we need to fix that now. That needs yep. to, why is there not one single spokesperson that is on Sky News, BBC News, on ITV, sits on GMTV, sits on all these things? You know, the world is frightened about food shortages. Should we should we ask someone from, you know, the, the fresh produce industry or the meat industry or the farming industry or the... I, and and I'll, okay, guys, can I just give you give you another example? I invited on a, a really great, passionate guy from a particular sector. He checked with his company and uh, his, his company who... I won't name. They they banned him because it didn't fit into their brand guidelines. But they don't have a brand. You, you look at like a forum like like this where we're trying to get the message out for people to to, to eat and consume. Talking about which, Julie, should we get get you going? Hey, I just saw the time, Matt. So yeah, so should I tell you what I'm cooking, please? And then you guys on to make the bait. Um, guys, guys, this how mad is this? This is a fantastic conversation, and Julie is now cooking for us. Can you see this? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So. So as I said at the start of this um, call, we, we heard that there was a, a shortage of eggs and people buying up a lot of white flour and yeast, presumably to make bread, which is a good thing, they're cooking. Um, so if there's no um, white flour around, maybe you should try buying some chickpea flour instead and making a, an egg omelette, um, eggless omelette, sorry, with chickpea flour. Um, we're celebrating British produce with this as well because we're also having some spring greens got some seaweed from um, Yorkshire, this wonderful sustainable seaweed farms, um, food of the future, that one. We've got some fava bean mole instead of avocado guacamole. And then we've got some mayo made from aquafaba and some fermented beetroot that I've had since January. So I'll get on with this and I'll talk well, to you. Um, you guys keep talking. I Okay, so uh, JP, thank you very much. JP uh, Dorgan, um, he, he very kindly threw in a question that's uh, one of the previous uh, webcasts, and he's uh, over in lovely uh, East Suff Suffolk, whichever is my East and West. Uh, Max, we need more farmers, growers, producers to be more vocal about what they do and how they do it uh, by backing it up with facts and figures. They need to be using the power of social media. You need to set up a show highlighting all of these great people in the public. Yeah, got, got all that, JP. Clive, you, with your great brand, social media, is that something Something that you're you're, you're uh, excited about, frightened about, passionate about, and, and Dan, we'll come over to you as well with the same question. Yes, social media is has changed the way we we approach the customer. We can get to the customer. We can bypass the supermarket. We can bypass you know the shops that we sell through. So we're able to communicate with those people directly, and they come back to us with positive comments and where can we buy your products and where is it available and you know they want to know all about it. Um, provenance and all that sort of thing and it's really important to engage with people on engage with people on social media i got the um the local um group what they call them next door type group to email out everybody saying we're open come and get some apple juice from the little shop we've got here just in the office and within an hour i had somebody give two cases and they were very happy to know we were open and there they were gone 
And Clive's brand is, is amazing. I've been into some um, uh, high-end London hotels when I've been meeting people, and his band's been there. Then I've been in my local pub up in Suffolk, and his band's been there. It's, it's, it's like it's everywhere. And, and Clive, I didn't, I didn't tell the other guys, but they've only come on on the basis that they're going to be buying some of your apple juice um, online a little, little bit later. So we will promote promote that. So everyone uh, buy some of uh, Clive's amazing apple juice, especially the raspberry one, because it's by far the the, uh, the best one. Uh, Dan, o- over to you. Your 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 brand and social media um if, if you didn't have social media would you would your brand be as strong I, I, I think we're lucky in as much that it's it's seen as a um, almost a vintage brand now three decades in but the power of so- social media for me is is phenomenal um look look at the different things that have happened in the last two weeks tomorrow night i'm in a virtual pub with my pals having a few beers um that that's done through through this technology it's absolutely phenomenal um for some of the success stories that will come from where we find ourselves. Uh, a good friend of mine farms just down the coast and he's got a farm shop. Um, he doesn't use social media very well until the last two weeks. He is maxed out 24 hours a day. They're cooking, baking, frying, doing whatever they can to keep up with demand. Um, it's been phenomenal. He did that through social media, purely social media. So it, there's a lesson here. The other, the other thing that we, we, we must recognise is on a Sunday night, the amount of people that still tune into Country File. So the great British public still absolutely love farming. They love the countryside. They love British agriculture. And that, that's just proven every week. Well done, Dan. And, and Chris, just coming back to you, just looking at, um, I think you can see some of the chats coming, coming in. Chris, do you, do you think that, that the politicians will be this all-encompassing answer for this this uh, body that we need all this spokesman george eustace mp he, he's a a, a previous uh, i think he might still be uh, his family still might farm uh, grow strawberries down, down in the west country somewhere but but chris do you think someone like george eustace should be driving this this uh, promotion of um, of uk fresh produce to the advantage of all uh yes and no i mean i don't know if they have the trust of the, of the people. It depends who they are and, and you know, the, their history. But I think it's it's probably too, um, too... Politics is too emotive, isn't it? You want to you, 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 you want to have it completely neutral. It needs to be someone yeah, you know, from our industry that isn't going to be antagonising this person or, or un, unpalatable to that person just because of the colour tie they wear or whatever. You know, we need... We need someone who has no allegiances to anything else other than the the, the, the industry and the consumer, you know, and, and trying to do the, the right thing for both of those people, not someone who's sitting in a role for, for a period of time, can't wait to get the next job or or looking, you know, ju- you know, trying to feather their own nest for, for future roles or positions or whatever it might be. Um, I think lots of our MPs actually have, have come from farming stock um, and some still currently do it. I was at a, an event at the, the House of... Uh, parliament the other day and there's quite a few farmers there to be honest you know um but i think this needs to be you know a a spokesperson who can communicate properly but actually has the the you know that can speak for the whole industry there's no point in someone coming out half cocked and and saying something that might be at the detriment of some sectors of the industry or some sections of it or some parts of it so but how do you do that we need to unify the whole industry and then only then can you speak for it you can't speak for it until it's it's one entity in the sense and that doesn't matter whether you're competitors or rivals or whatever you know we have to we have to come absolutely for the greater good um you know and, and i'm sure other industries have managed it we need to do it and and then only that point because you know you could say oh you know and i've seen the thing you should do it you should do it how can i go and speak for a whole you can't, i can't speak for a whole industry the whole industry isn't you know, a one thing at the moment until we realize yeah, what, yeah. we need, what our agendas are what our, goals, what our goals are only then can you speak on behalf of it yeah and it also exacerbates me with the the lights of the engineering sector that every year when you watch out for it every year they're pre-programmed to come out with um what why you should get a job in engineering and it was about four months ago they had a a very attractive um uh, young lady who'd done her degree and was um working for a big manufacturing company and explaining that uh, uh, she got a job knowing that she wasn't going to be physically doing nuts and bolts it was all about some um, cad engineering and the, and the point i'm trying to make is that they they show 
showcased her to show the attraction of getting into engineering yeah. and every year they come, come out with the same thing because they are orchestrated they have a, a really good marketing body marketing team and they just trigger it every, every year and you look at us we right bomb fight before this all, all happened so again trying to be be positive that if we can have this reset and, and come to a meeting of minds and have one voice come coming out at the end of this by 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 british don't, don't overlook the uh, our overseas friends but by british because this is good and it is good for for, for uh, uk industry chris you said a really interesting thing earlier about how um pre, pre all this we were but six percent of uh, gdp uh, someone uh, feel free to correct me if i'm wrong with with the demise of of the the airlines and uh oh god the the, the a number of large caterers you could see how that gtp level for ag and food and, and fisheries is going to rapidly rise up so it's even more important for us to pro, uh, to promote it out yeah absolutely J julie how are you getting on yeah not bad can you see what i'm doing yeah, I'm, I'm so. I'm hope, hopefully, everyone can out out there in the in the land. So we've got uh, the overhead shot. Whoops, I'm gonna get off. I go go back to gallery view. Go, we've got the overhead shot of uh, of Julie cooking. Can you can you can you see what I'm doing? Yeah, Julie, what's your favourite fresh produce? What's my favourite fresh produce? Probably Correct. Watercress. watercress, exactly what's on this plate right now. I love it. It's just wow. it's for pesto, really good. Uh, Dan, what is your favourite fresh produce? Potatoes. <laughs> no brainer. <laughs> Apples. How, uh, uh, Clive, what's your favourite fresh produce? Let's see where this is going. <laughs> Uh, and Clive, just coming to, coming back to your other side of your business, your your um, soft fruit business, um, it, is there a likelihood that you could create a brand for that soft fruit business on on a local basis where you are in Suffolk, as you have done with your with your apple juice? Do you think that would work? Uh, I, we've never tried. I've never given it the thought because the sheer volume of the stuff that we sell to the supermarkets, just you know, the, we sell some at the gate. Um, but the volume that you sell at the gate is just a minuscule amount compared to what you can shift through all the supermarkets. So we're geared up for volume. We're not geared up for, you know, just the odd planet here and there. Um, there are plenty of farmers who do do it, but on a smaller scale. Okay, because I, I don't know if you heard one of the webcasts we did I think it was a couple of weeks ago, uh, where there was a large soft fruit grower who had some of their um, demand turned off by the by the retailers because the retailers were moving over to frozen and non perishable uh, during this peak peak buying period, and so they were looking to buy themselves a, a blast freezer to blast um, freeze uh, their, their, their their soft produce to sell it to the consumer direct. Would you ever contemplate doing anything like that with your soft fruit business? So so we do. As such, my cousin, um, Craig, over in, um, in Braintree in, in Essex, he does exactly that. He takes our, um, our raspberries, if we have some or whatever other fruit that he can get from around the country, and he blast freezes it and he sells that straight into um, farm shops in those frozen boxes. Okay. And, and Dan, coming back to yourself, can you, you see um, uh, Kessel when you get out the other side of this? Can, are you just going to continue as normal or are you going to adapt and redevelop your business and try new new lines under your under your uh, brand or, 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 or and try new things? Or is now not the time to, to go for a, a shiny new penny exercise and it's uh, time to, to uh, just stick to the knitting? I think a bit of both. I, I, I think realistically, there should every business should learn from what, what we're going through. Um, uh, God forbid this ever happens again, but it could happen again. Um, yep. for, for me now, this, this is all about innovation. So um, the entrepreneurs will come out the other end of this. Uh, the challenges are quite clear for the sector. Um, so it's now, I think, aligning with government. Um, we, we seem to have found quite a few hundred million. We've been talking about getting out of Europe for so long um, and trying to find 39, 39 billion to get out of Europe. And all of a sudden, that seems almost like arse change now, uh, if I can excuse my parlance. Um, innovation. It, the sector needs to innovate. I, I think we've, we've captured it all now. We need um, the industry to come together. It's proven its metal over the last two, two weeks. Yep. The, the way it has spun on a penny stamp and as... as even down to street level in small corner shops and farm gates, how it's responded, how it's supported the supermarkets and vice versa. 
You couldn't be prouder, prouder of the sector today if you tried. It now needs that support from government to take it through and go, right, what does the future look like? We all will be sat around tables at the end of this going, what do we, do, what do we need to do differently? If you don't, you should be. And, and, and Dan, uh, oh, am I really going to ask this question? Um, Brexit. Uh, so all of last year was all talk about Brexit. Yep. That, that seems so far away now. Surely we, we can't proceed with Brexit um, as we are because we're in such a that this is the big, biggest financial shock to the UK and the world global economic system since the Second World War. What, what's your thought? You're very well connected. If it's OK to ask you, what's your thoughts on, on Brexit? Do you think it's going to get parked? So we, so we try and find some solution on a health basis and, uh, and, and an economic situation come the end of the end of the year. Do you think Brexit is going to be parked? You're the first person to mention Brexit to me in the last three weeks. Um, I think naturally it will be parked. Um, I'll speak as me personally. I, I you know, I voted to remain. Um, I'm, I was a staunch European. Um, however, you follow the vote and, you know, you make the best of what the country has decided and I respect that. However, we're going to take some time to get over this, Max. This, this isn't this isn't two weeks. This isn't two months. This isn't six months. I think businesses will be recovering from this from a num for a number of years now. So um, I think the debate needs to be had whether that's parked um and i i think when it becomes an issue today the issue we're losing people hand over fist hundreds a day we're losing that's got to be our issue that's got to be the thing we deal with and i i do hope i'm not seeing it at the moment but i do hope that some of the stuff that's been happening over the last two weeks shows that there's some strength being part of europe um haven't seen any yet but um i do know that spain 10 days ago a week ago put their hand up and said help I think that was NATO help, which is a European, essentially a European conglomerate, um, asked for help. Um, and I think we will pull out stories of where Europe's worked over the next yep. few weeks. So, yep. that's me. Well done, Dan. I, I don't know if you heard the, the, the slightly funny one that uh, apparently uh, Russia, and this is true, has, has sent over a huge amount of medical equipment to, to, the, to the US without Mr. Trump uh, acknowledging that. But Putin has stated that they sent it to America as, as human, humanitarian aid, just to rub salt in the wounds to, uh, to, to, to Mr. Trump. I think he was more annoyed he didn't see the plane coming in because it was a stealth plane. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and, and, Cl and Clive, your, your, your thoughts on, on, on Brexit. I, I know you've got other things to, 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 to think about, to, to worry about, but what's your view? Do you think it's going to get parked? Has our Clive muted himself again? Yes, he muted himself. Um, I can't see it going forward. Um, certainly for the next couple of years, we, we've got too much to dig out of. It's just not going to happen for a while. Yeah, well said. So, Julie, come on, show us our virtual meal that all of us, uh, all of us are going, going to eat. Um, up, us us uh, panel guests and uh, everyone online and on Facebook. Can you see it? Yeah. So, so we've got this chickpea uh, flour omelette with seaweed, as I said, in, in, the, in the batter. It's also got um, turmeric, um, salt, pepper, some cider vinegar, etc. We've got a watercress salad with some radish. This is just what I had in my fridge. And as I mentioned earlier, we've got the fava bean mole, and etc. Um, but can I just finish? I'm just, I agree with what Dan was saying. I think uh, innovation is what we need, but we need resilience. Um, as an industry, and, and, and that's what the financial services um, industry needed to come together to do, to make sure that they weren't reliant on taxpayers' money to bail them out. So the regulators made them be more resilient. So, And I, I just think we need an independent body to help the industry in that way. Again, as I was saying, not stifle it, but help support it. And, and because this, yes, this coronavirus challenge will be over soon, hopefully, but there might be another challenge. We don't know what it is around the corner. And so we need that to do it. Julie, well done. So guys, we're just, just uh, running out of time. Um, I just want to thank our panel guests hugely I, th I think it's been an, another um, amazing show just it, it it's, it's it's fantastic having this eclectic mix from uh, an amazing chef nutritionist like like julie um to dan from norfolk with his amazing brand clive with his uh, amazing apple juice who we'll come on to in a minute um chris who's been voted for prime minister um for president of the u.s well just glo global leader so chris has all signed up for, for that one he, he's we'll, we'll push him a, over the line um just to say uh, thank you again to um to our sponsors who we wouldn't be able to run this um uh, without 
Um, our next webinar is planned for Tuesday, the 7th of April at 2 p.m. Um, we are talking on the, on the subject of salads, veg, supply chain dynamics, labor issues, food waste. We, we're going to cover it all on that one. And we've got Jack Ward, CEO of British Growers, Andrew Burgess, Director of uh, Agriculture for Produce World, Beverly Dixon, Group HR Director of G's, Rick Sanderson of the Qdex Group, and Will Hill, who um, Chris and I have just been chatting about, uh, of FruPro, who's... Um, uh, created an amazing uh, business for making sure that uh, none of the fresh produce waste that's been generated during this period is, uh, has been, been wasted. So just going to run back to um, everyone, just to give a, a wrap up from, from their perspective. Um, Dad, you, 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 you start us off. What, what's, your, what's your advice to everyone um, as we get through this period to hopefully create some form of success from it? What's your advice, please? Um, cherish what we have. Um, we, we talked at Red Tractor, you know, fervently believe Red Tractor is right to set the standards and govern the standards, um, engagement with government, um, and I'll say it again, innovation. We have proved that we're resilient. The sector is resilient, but innovation now and marketing, marketing, marketing. Okay, I come back to you, Julie, uh, but possibly you, you, would, you would agree with Dan or is there anything else to add over and above for what you very kindly said earlier? Well, I think as a consumer, um... box scheme also order from your local keep keep those you know, takeaways coming keep them in business and that will have impact all the way down the supply chain well done chris for prime minister what's your views please to wrap up uh, well so i mean the two two views really the, the the public facing one is you know make sure that when you're choosing what to buy and where to buy from make sure that you you buy and support from the people that will inevitably support you when it all goes wrong um in terms of the industry i think we need to make sure that even though lots of things that you've been doing have been an amazing and philanthropic and, and not you know and i think you know we've, we've seen so many examples of principle before profit you know i know you know in the new covent garden market their whole industry was absolutely decimated they're still sending vans full of produce to hospitals to donate you know fruit you, you know, you've taken literally 90% of their business away from them, i.e. 90% of their money, and they're still donating stuff. You know, there's, and, and that's one example. There's so, so many examples of, of you know, really heartwarming generosity. Um, but we've got to make sure that it's, people know about it. I know that's not the reason that you're doing it, but, but certainly by the end of this, you know, and I don't know if, if self-promotion is, is, is relevant and, and right now. I think it's about get on with it and get everything done, fix it, but then make sure that everybody's aware of all the amazing things this industry has done to make sure that people were fed, people were, were looked after, and and you know, people were supported. And this industry has done that amazingly well. But you know, but it's, I am I'm so you know as as we all are so so proud of my industry that you know I've been proud of anyway. But you know it's just absolutely elevated recently. So well done to everybody. But make sure that we're documenting it, and we need we all have a responsibility to make sure that the public know. What an amazing industry this is come the end. Chris, well done. And Clive, over to you. This this is going to be a blatant promotion. We want to find out where we can buy your amazing apple juice, please. Uh, online, mainardhouse.co.uk. Bottles, bottles. Give us, show us the bottles. Show us the bottles. It's bottles, the bottles over here. Max likes this one. Max likes that look one. At Look at, look at that amazing brand. And so we'll put the, 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 the link up on there. Just, just say the website again, please. Uh, Maynardhouse.co.uk. Excellent. I, and guys, just, just to wrap up, I'd, I'd already uh, uh, teed you up for this, but we had a request from uh, a great uh, technical consultancy business called uh, TechDK, and they've launched a campaign today, a hashtag whistle for, for workers. So on the basis of um, the, the, the clap for the likes of the NHS, um, they want to raise the morale in the facilities and pack houses across the UK um, so that everyone within the fresh food uh, sector knows that they're being been recognized and so they've come up with a with a great tune and all all my gang here we're going to have a go at uh, whistling at the appropriate uh, appropriate uh, point with this uh, catchy tune that they've created right gang are you ready ready here we go one two three and you can dance along especially you clive i've seen your dancing <laughs> chris you've got to move a bit <laughs> Excellent, guys. Thank you very much for your participation.
be well everyone keep safe keep washing your hands and we'll get to the last whistle here we go bye all thank you very much